Hi, DNA. This is Erin, and I'm here with Becky Kern Kakula, who is an international motivational speaker and a disability inclusion advisor. And we're going to talk to her today about her work for the disabled community and uh, lots of other things. So, welcome, Becky. We're so grateful to have you here. Thank you for taking the time Thank to meet you with for us. Me. I'm so glad to be here. Yay. Um, so, the first question I was interested in is if we could talk about language. Because I've noticed doing some reading that people with dwarfism, uh, it's not necessarily clear how they prefer to be spoken about. I've heard different things. And I wanted to ask you in general how the community prefers to be identified and then also how you prefer to be identified and why. I'm just going to put it out there into the universe. I do hope to have a book someday and I want it to be called Just Call Me Becky because people get so caught up in the terminology and at the end of the day, people want to be addressed by their name. But I understand in certain scenarios, I always use the example, my best friend who's not a little person was preparing some friends before a pub crawl one Christmas season and she wanted to give them a little bit of a heads up that her friend who's a little person was going to come to the pup crawl so they wouldn't be crazy and say anything that I would not want to be around mm -hmm. just like so they would have proper etiquette yeah. so there are scenarios where you need to kind of build some context to prepare people so it prevents it from getting awkward real fast but in most cases, like if you address someone by their name, you can get to know them and then you can go down any of those roads of how do you feel about this term, that term or the other. So I'm only speaking for myself, Becky Karn Kakula. I'm okay with the term little person. I'm okay with the term dwarf, not okay with the term midget. And I would say that a majority of the community of little people uh, prefer not to be called a midget. Well, we definitely compare it to other uh, terminology used in other communities, but it's important to address the fact that it is a word that we don't prefer. Yeah, of course. Uh, but, uh, so as I said, my name, little person dwarf, dwarfism is the diagnosis that I have. Achondroplasia is the more specific diagnosis that I have. So I could be called an achondroplastic dwarf. Uh, when I was growing up, it was funny trying to educate some of my friends thinking that I was plastic, but <laughs> not the case. It's just the plasia. Uh, but I would just say, dress someone by their name, but don't be afraid to use the term little person or dwarf and someone will call you out and stand up for themselves if they prefer not to be called that but i don't think they'll react as badly as you just quickly addressing them as a midget and uh, that sometimes comes off as someone isn't willing to learn how to change their perspective on how to address us and treat us in a respectful manner yeah, thank you for that. The main reason I ask is in the context of employment, because I agree, nobody wants, or I, I doubt most people want to be identified by their medical diagnoses. Um, that's, most of us like to be called our name, and that, that makes perfect sense to me, at least. Um, but I was thinking that since you work on employment discrimination, it occurred to me that if people don't know what terms to use, they might be more likely to not be inclusive in the workplace. So that just that subtle way in which even if they unconsciously don't know that they don't know what terms to use or feel comfortable using or what their friend might feel comfortable with, that still could actually be a barrier. And that's why I bring it up first because that's, that's the thing I was mostly concerned about. Do you see that being an issue? You're absolutely correct. So uh, a few years ago, I went to an LGBT inclusion in the workplace advocates summit, which had about 6,000 people and some of the disability inclusion summits that we've put together have had half the amount of people uh, still equally as valuable content, but uh, people are kind of leaning towards those demographic areas that have made more progress historically historically and it does trace to civil rights and laws and things uh, that have passed and made more advancement and protections but when it comes to disability people are so afraid of using the word the wrong terminology it prevents them from being inclusive prevents them from just calling out the word disability in their diversity statements intentionally putting disability 
in every conversation about diversity and inclusion and beyond. And 70% of disabilities are invisible. So that means only 30% of people have a physical disability like me and 70% are people who are hiding it because of the way that society is afraid to talk about it. So that conference that I'd gone to, I remember having some follow-up conversations with some companies that have made a lot of their focus on people of color inclusion, LGBT inclusion. But the minute we got on the phone and we were trying to tell them about our disability inclusion efforts, they immediately responded like, we're not ready for that. Like, we don't even know what terms to use. And you're just like, well, what are you waiting for? You yeah. treat people like people, call them like by their name, and then you'll start to have a dialogue and it'll lead to some meaningful impact. Yeah. It takes having someone at a high level. Like we always use the example of Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella has two children with disabilities. He openly talks about it and it's integrated in the core of the entire company. The amount of accessibility efforts they have going on and they're constantly thinking about how to meet the needs of every single human on the planet to make them feel empowered to do more. And it takes having people at high levels to open up about their relationship to disability and then training gets set up real fast, etiquette, inclusion, uh, events around uh, different months related to disability. Ideally, we have disability programming throughout the year, but it at least gets the conversation started when people are held accountable based on that executive's higher relationship and power. Yeah, you know, I'm a former teacher of people with intellectual disabilities, and I learned in that experience that accessibility is really for everyone, that it truly, and, that, and that's not just the reason to do it. There's, we should all be, uh, in my opinion, trying to support the most vulnerable people in society because that, who's vulnerable changes all the time. I might be vulnerable today, you might be vulnerable tomorrow and the next person, you know, that, yeah. that COVID gives us a really good example of that. But it's access helps everybody, you know, um, and especially as you point out, people with invisible illnesses, people with invisible disabilities, um, or all the people who may become disabled in their lives. You know, it's uh, very, people don't understand that they're more likely to become uh, they're more likely to be affected by disability as they age, you know, and they don't, people don't tend to understand, or people without disabilities don't tend to understand that they're part of that continuum too. So I think that that's really important. Um, sorry, were you going to say something else? I say we're a community that doesn't discriminate. Anyone could join our party at any time. Yeah. And I think <laughs> the more we expose society to the importance of disability inclusion, the more dis the less discouraged someone will feel once they eventually acquire a disability. Yes. Yes. Um, absolutely. So speaking of this word disability, I know that the little person community, is that the right way to say it? Yeah. Li the yeah. little people community, little person, <laughs> plural, singular. Yeah. I like to put these moments into our interviews because I think it's important to model that we can make mistakes and talk about these things. Um, and move through them. <laughs> uh, and I think you've made the point already implicitly that it would be much better to treat someone with respect and dignity and make a mistake um, and learn from it than to unconsciously exclude them because you're scared of making a mistake, right? Absolutely, so I have a boss in a previous role and he and I got to a really good place where we met each other where we were. And I, my whole life, I've craved constructive feedback because I just haven't gotten enough of it. Like if I make a mistake, I want to know so I can get better. Yeah. But he always used the phrase, in the future, try doing it this way. And I've, I've brought that into even my relationships at home and other scenarios. So it's, let's, let's reflect quickly on what happened and let's talk about how to do it better in the future. Yeah, that's a really good strategy. Um, so the back to the word disability, I, I've read that it there's uh, some contention about uh, whether people in the little people community feel, and again, you can't speak for everybody, obviously, but feel like they identify with the term disabled. And I know that legally um, you, you are protected by the ADA, but 
Um, how, do you want to talk a little bit about how that word, um, because we, we're going to get to this later, but you and I have spoken already about how it's an interesting position to be in when your disability is created by the world, not the other way around. So if the world was built for people of shorter stature or little people, that would not be considered a disability, right? Um, and so I'm wondering if you want to reflect a little bit on that. Absolutely. I think we often just dance around the word disability just as a society in general. And that's probably where that perspective came from when it comes to the little people community and how people feel about the word. And I would say probably it's really just been maybe the past decade in through my advocacy work that I've really taken ownership of the fact that being a little person is a disability. I'm sure my parents can tell everyone that, that w when I was younger, like I just was afraid of the word and even just the word handicap, even though people prefer to use the word disability or disabled, uh, even thinking about like a handicap placard. I yeah. learned recently at a symposium, it was put on by doctors who are experts when it comes to working with patients with dwarfism. And they talked about the, num the two reasons that people with dwarfism pass away based on social security numbers they were able to gather of people who've passed over the past few years. And one was blood pressure because they never really know if they get a good read of our blood pressure, like if it's too high or too low. And it's like, because the, the cuff, like our arms are shorter up here. Well, the people with my type of dwarfism, but others are made up of different ways, but it, even like a child cuff may not get a, a full grasp of it. So they have come up with some better techniques, but we don't even know, like if it's a low blood pressure or high blood pressure, is it really? Like that's one thing that just hasn't fully been figured out. And then the other one was getting hit by cars because people can't see us. So it's very important for us to if, get a handicap placard because it helps us park closer to the venue of where we're going, where we're less likely to get hit by a car. Yeah. And that was like a huge realization. One of the reasons I ended up getting a handicap placard, I was living in California at the time, I couldn't even reach the parking meters, especially the ones where they've added the credit card feature. So I don't even know what it says when I'm putting in the card. So in some states, if you have a handicap placard, it prevents you from having to go through that process with the meters. But I would say just as a whole, as the community, there actually is a divide within the Little People community, members of Little People of America who acquire a disability in addition to having dwarfism and those who may not look like they have a disability. And there are often times where people tell me, you don't have a disability. But I try to kind of fight back and say, I am part of the disability community. I do require accommodations in certain scenarios, and it's not necessarily a bad thing to be part of the disability community. And I think it's just people don't know where to put us, since there are only 30,000 little people in the US and about 200,000 worldwide, like, we don't have another category to fit into, even if people wanted to box us into another category. And it's still socially, society hasn't figured out how to successfully integrate us in every single scenario. Uh, it's clear there are moments like trying to try out for a professional basketball career. It may, it may not be the best idea for some people, but we try to stay empowered to go after what we're passionate about, but have to be mindful of those accommodations that we may need in certain scenarios. But there are some moments, like when I'm traveling, I always use this example, uh, just with, with hotels. I prefer not to have an ADA accessible hotel room because things tend to go up higher with the wheelchair fitting underneath the sink or getting to the bed. And I wanna have a standard room with the step stool. And most step stools only cost 10 to $15. But the amount of hurdles I have to go through because people just want to have that you fit in the box or you don't fit in the box description of how accommodations are handled, uh, the world's still figuring that out. And they think like if you're one person asking for a stool, you're only staying here one night out of the thousands of other nights where we don't have someone requesting a stool, is it really worth it? 
But I really enjoy those experiences where even if they admit to me, they don't have one, but they'll go out to a store and get one because the hotel room is like $300. So if they go get a stool for $10, they're only gaining my respect as a thankful for helping me figure it out and uh, a little bit more loyalty. But, it, but that's such an interesting example because it suggests that we've only integrated disability into our society. And you can see with the ADA designated rooms, we, we have a picture in our mind of what a person with disabilities is. And the ADA room suggests that it's a person with mobility issues who utilizes a wheelchair. And so all the other people who might need, you know, uh, perhaps you have a condition where, you know, you, a sensory condition where you're overloaded by um, smells and sounds and you need to be in a certain part of the hotel where you can be safe from that, um, that room would do nothing for you. Um, and it would be very easy for, as you're pointing out, for the hotel to say, well, we don't understand that. We didn't know that was a disability. We didn't know that was protected. Um, yeah, that's incredibly frustrating. <laughs> but I have been, I, I will say that there are some hotels that we've been learning from each other and they're trying to figure out ways to be more intentional and address more than just the wheelchair user community versus non-wheelchair user. And then when you were talking earlier about just the universal design piece, I there's a comic strip out there. I'm sure you've heard of it, but it's like, it's a snowy day. There's a wheelchair user who comes up to a building and the wheelchair user is asking the guy who's shoveling to plow the ramp. And he said, after I do the stairs, but if he did the ramp, everyone would be able to access the building. And he chose to do the stairs first. Yeah. And it's just, I, I, it takes educating <laughs> on how we could ensure access for everyone as soon as possible. And also I think, centering an image of the human that is broader in every way and more inclusive in every way than the version that we've kind of built our society around, you know? I agree. Um, it's interesting something you, you, with the hotel example, we recently interviewed the directors of Crib Camp um, and Jim Lebrecht, one of the directors, was saying that people with disabilities can MacGyver anything, you know? Um, can build accommodations for themselves are sort of natural hackers. Um, I also have a friend who is blind, who's a hacker and does a talk about this called Blind Hackers. It's really interesting. That's not just about actual like hacking on the computer, but sort of the ethos of hacking things. But I think I like how you're challenging the institutions to do that. Like you could carry a stool, but you could, they can also go to Walmart and get a stool, you know, and that's important that they do that because there will be somebody else who comes. And even if there isn't, it's important that they do that because it's the right thing to do, you know? Exactly. Um, so I think it's really interesting how I think people with disabilities and mental health issues get used to figuring out how to get around things because we want to compensate uh, to keep other people comfortable. And I like how you're sort of pushing people, you know, in a gentle way to be a little uncomfortable, you know, and do yeah. their part. And kind of on the disability, uh, figuring things out topic and little people, uh, there, the reality is that most little people require some type of surgical procedure at some point in their life, just because of the way that we're built and made. And some have had dozens. I've had eight. I would consider three major and then the tubes in and out of my ears and tonsils and adenoids, which seem a little bit more standard than some of the others. But any of those uh, are related to different types of medical complications. Uh, but it's something we don't talk about as a community because we don't want there to be another thing of, of people being fearful of interacting with us. So I'm not going to just tell people like, let me tell you my story and you should feel bad for me because I had to go in and out of the hospital. I missed 29 days in high school because of my back surgery when I lost my ability to walk. Like those things, like even though people look at me and they're like, you don't have a disability. They don't know the full story, but we don't want to go too deep because we don't want people to be sympathetic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's an experience that a people with all different situations in all different situations have had, um, at least 
from what we've been doing at Different Enable, we've been hearing that from a lot of people. Yeah. Because okay. there is acceptance, but also only up to a point. And so you're sort of always toggling between, you know, do I reveal, we, we were talking on the website about dating mm -hmm. and do I reveal my mental health diagnosis on my Tinder? Uh, do I, when do I do that? Should I feel like I have to? Um, you know, uh, or is that my own business? You know, it's very hard to find that line because shame is diminishing and you want to be the person who is helping it diminish, but also it's such a profound risk, you know? Yeah, and then just this, the safety piece. Oh, absolutely. Like wanting to disclose, but not wanting it to, and of course it leads to ghosting in certain scenarios and- And job discrimination, of course. Absolutely. So, <laughs> I can speak to that one. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit because that is really the core of your work, it seems like, and the and sort of a core passion for you. Um, and I'm wondering if you could sort of sum up for us how far you think we've come as a culture in terms of employment discrimination against people with disabilities and where you feel we urgently need to go next. Um, I know that's a massive question that could be answered with like an 80, 800 page book, but just however you feel comfortable, you know, responding to it would be great. <laughs> Absolutely. So based on my personal experience, I received a college degree, thought I was on the track to uh, meaningful and gainful employment right after college, just like everyone else when they receive their degree, expect to get a career to then supplement what their college gave them uh, and the finances that you probably want to be able to pay back. Uh, and I ended up choosing not to put on my resume that I was a little person. This was before a lot of the technology that exists today, like LinkedIn and Facebook, where it's pretty obvious, especially I think even just with a headshot, like I have very obvious facial features that are common among people with dwarfism. So there isn't a ton of hiding now with all of that exists out there. And that's up to me as a human being wanting to build my profile socially. So there are probably little people in the professional world who you still can't find anywhere on the internet and may still keep it private on their resume. But I, I so I ended up moving from Boston. I went to school in Providence, Rhode Island, was home in Boston for the summer, worked in casting, television casting, movie casting, a little bit of both. Uh, I was actually supposed to be a stand-in for Peter Dinklage in the movie Underdog. Oh, and wow. it was going to be like a $4,000 summer just standing in while they set up the lighting while he acts. But it conflicted with my last two weeks of college. And obviously, I needed to get that college degree in order to then get the career I thought I'd be getting to in a smooth manner. So I still asked if I could help out with the casting process throughout the summer. So I helped with the casting of the extras, sometimes calling up to 300 people a day. And I got really intrigued by the entertainment industry as a whole from that experience. And I had also met some people through Little People of America over the years while I was in college. I didn't get involved until I was in college. And then most of the people who I just happened to get along with happened to live in Southern California. Mm -hmm. So my parents told me, you can move out to California if you get a job and have a place to live. I ended up getting a job and found a place to live just with friends on their couch until I got established. And the person I was supposed to work for happened to be another little person. She was a talent manager. She was a talent manager for one of my friends. And right when I got out to California, the job fell through, wasn't gonna lead to anything. So I ended up networking as much as possible. I found some people within the Providence College alumni network who happened to be living in Southern California, looked for guidance everywhere, ended up sending out about a thousand resumes and went on a hundred interviews over the course of four months. Yeah, I saw that in your, on your website. That's a lot. Yeah, so sometimes it was up to four a day. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, I'm sure by that third or fourth, I was exhausted because of being rejected by body language even with the first two or the first one, like I probably was not on my A game in every one of those interviews, but no one told me that. So then I assumed because no one told me that, that I was not capable of getting the job because of my stature. 
and it was a job. These were like low level entry jobs. I wasn't applying for like CEO jobs out of college, like very entry level. I had the qualifications. So after the four months of interviewing, I started going through some temporary placement agencies. So then they could pitch me to just go show up in workplaces. And I did a few assignments and then um, at about the six month mark, I was able to get a job at a big talent agency. And one of the reasons I ended up getting a job there was the Hispanic marketing department had an opening. And I think just because of like this person working in an area of diversity, Mm -hmm. she had a little bit of empathy and was willing to support me. And I did get a call from HR after a month there and they're like, your term's over. And this lady fought on my behalf and I'm forever grateful that she helped me launch some part of my career because she advocated and knew I needed that support. And she hired someone else to work with me alongside me as we supported her clients. Unfortunately, I took French in high school instead of Spanish. So I wasn't as equipped as I would Mm -hmm. hope to be in that role, but I got the support I needed just to learn about the entertainment business. And then when there was an opening in entertainment marketing, more English speaking clients and agents, I was able to transition and I did that for about two years and then switched over to the comedy touring department, booking comedians around the country. But one of the biggest things was most assistants stay there a year and then they go, if they don't want to be an agent, they go to a production company or a management company and just take different positions within the entertainment industry. But I was there for five years, didn't really have any support even if I wanted to move up within the organization. And I chose to switch gears, work in television casting, similar thing, just didn't really have the support to learn and grow. I still worked as hard as I could, a hundred times harder than the person next to me every day, but it still wasn't going to change the fact that they felt different about me because of my stature. And there were moments where it was obvious versus just give me constructive feedback and I'll do better and we can do better together. And so after six and a half years, I moved back to Boston. During that time, I was living with the, my roommate who was my roommate for about four of the six and a half in California. And he was a little person actor. So one of the reasons why I was passionate about working in that industry was making sure there were better roles for him because he would turn down roles that were negative, but that also affected whether or not he was getting work or able to make a living. And I wanted to have there be more positive portrayals. He was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. So as I was kind of on my way out, he needed to move back to his hometown in Georgia. And I decided to move back to Boston to be with my family. Dealt with the stigma of being an adult living at home, dealt with the disability living at home. Did that for about a year and a half, had the support to stay longer. But then I was offered a job in New York at the Actors Union there for three and a half years. And I had the support. So from the talent agency to the television casting to the the Actors Union, I was able to fully disclose that I was a little person at that point. And most of the jobs that I was able to acquire were Mm -hmm. through personal networking opportunities. And while I was at the Actors Union, my boss did advocate for me to get a promotion, but the people above him just kept shutting it down. And then that's what kind of made me transition after three and a half years of working in disability inclusion in the corporate space, because I think corporations are more eager to do better faster than the entertainment industry that's very focused on box office numbers and image. And it's all about like, it's not who you are, it's what you can play. And even though I am still passionate about that space because we need to change what we see in the media because it affects how we're treated in society, uh, I know there's a lot further to go. But now that I've started to work in the corporate disability inclusion space, I think employers are trying to do better. I think one of the biggest challenges is the self-ID rates. And most companies don't even announce it publicly what their rates are. Ideally, we get to a place where 20% of every company has a disability because that's the population. Uh, And federal contractors are required to have a 7% hiring goal. They could have a goal, but you don't know how they're working towards it all the time. But I think it's 
corporations are eager to do better and whether it's because they've had their hands slapped in the past, uh, but it's getting them to intentionally include disability in every conversation and make it known that you're willing to make an accommodation so then that person feels more empowered to ask for it. Yeah. So that's a, that leads to another question I had, which is oftentimes in employment situations, we see accessibility, accessibility measures put in after someone who needs them comes. And often even after someone who needs them comes and has survived without them for a long time and then has earned respect and people then say, oh, you have a mental illness? I didn't realize that. You know, I didn't know you needed to access this uh, support. Or, and they like you then, and so then they say, okay, we can do that for you, of course. We see your value. Um, but how do we get employers to do exactly what you just said, where they can um, make there be no barrier to applying? Because I think a lot of times people with disabilities understand the unspoken uh, rules, which is we are accessible, but that might mean only one kind of disability can be responded to. They're not prepared to respond to different needs. And so how do you, I mean, because obviously it has to happen on both sides, the employer and the employee, but it must, it, it's, it's, there's a barrier to applying because we know what has historically happened. So how do you think we should address that? That's a great point. I would say even in my past environments, I didn't really ask for an accommodation probably till my third job. Yeah. And when I did, it was because they put it out there. Like we have an ergonomic specialist who's willing to work with you and like, let us know what stools you need. So they got me a stool for my desk and then another one for one of the bathrooms. And this was all on the fifth floor of a building. But a few months later, the admin person comes over to my desk and is like panicked because she woke up in the middle of the night thinking about what if I wanted to access the other kitchens and sinks and bathrooms on the floor if I was maybe in a meeting on the other floor. So she went and like took it upon herself to go and get the stools. And I always am like, it's treading water because it's a reasonable accommodation in the areas that I use the most. I have these stools. Maybe I can ask for help when I'm using those other bathrooms. So I wasn't necessarily thinking of it as like, this needs to happen. But it was nice that she, <laughs> I guess, lost sleep over it to be able to fix uh, that concern. And I would say that it is on both sides. I think the candidate needs to feel empowered to ask what they need to succeed, but also the employer needs to create that dialogue to allow them to have that conversation. And I think there's just a lot of stigma around the word accommodation and money and most accommodations, like the Job Accommodation Network has it laid out, are less than $500. And at the end of the day, the amount of productivity you're going to get out of that person, it's totally worth it. Yeah. Well, that leads to another point I wanted to ask you about. So we were speaking to the singer, Mandy Harvey. Love her. Has, yeah, she's great. And um, she is deaf. And she was talking about how we're in this, she, she actually was really inspiring about the potential of this particular moment. And she said, you know, I think one of the few good things about this pandemic is we have realized that a vast majority of people can work from home, maybe not majority, but a vast proportion of people can work from home. And what would that mean to people who have mobility issues or uh, any disability really? Um, that, that, once, per, once jobs had to accommodate that to keep the bottom line going because of COVID, now they see, oh, we can do this all the time. This is not impossible. How do you think that, could that be a benefit for people with disabilities um, in terms of employment access? Yeah, I think so. As I always say, I'm speaking for myself and my perspective. I currently work in a job that's completely remote. So even mm -hmm. if COVID wasn't happening, I would be remote, but I'd probably be more likely to go to coffee shops and socialize with people that way because we all crave that socialization piece. <laughs> so I think I've had a lot of conversations with 
people about this topic in particular. And I think it would be amazing to give more people the option, especially uh, wheelchair users in big cities who rely on Accessoride and other types of public transportation that may cause them to be late to their job because that's another thing that makes us all frantic. Like when we're going above and beyond to do our best, like we don't wanna be late. and we want to be there for the whole time and sometimes you have to set up rides like the beginning and the end uh, right when you're doing your performance and you're not able to talk to anyone before or after and networking or they don't come and you have to spend 50 bucks on an uber you right, know exactly. you don't have that money yeah right so a lot of that i think has been alleviated because of what's happening and i think people are realizing the amount of productivity but there is going to be a population of people that do want a chance to go back to the physical workspace once it's safe to do so. And we have to be mindful that that's equally as important to allow that option because we don't want to go backwards in the physical space. Really we don't want point. corporations to think, oh, now that they're able to work from home, we don't have to figure out how to accommodate. This is easy peasy and we're just going to go backwards. Uh, we want to make sure there's a presence in both places and I'm sure it's, it's going to come down to personal choices and what people want to do and feel safe to do, but we can't just have the population go away in the physical space once everyone wow. else lives. I had not thought of that at all, and that's such a good point that uh, there could be an economic pressure to push people with disabilities to work from home, which could be really isolating and pernicious, actually. So that's a really helpful dimension to, you know, it has these... Yeah great potential for certain people, but also, and I think in general, as we start to understand that everyone needs accessibility, that everyone has vulnerabilities, that we start to broaden our understanding of what a human is, you know, just the idea that people could work for remote sometimes is much more accommodating in general to people, regardless of their status with regard to disability. Um, and I'd like to see accommodations in general that sort of account for people's humanity, but you're right, we certainly don't want to say, oh, we don't need a ramp because uh, yeah. this person is going to work from home now. Um, that's really helpful. Um, so I just had a couple more questions. Um, and this has been so, so helpful. And I really appreciate it. And then we can talk about anything you're interested in, or I can just let you go enjoy your afternoon. Um, oh, hi. But I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that idea of being made disabled by the world. Um, I grew up with a strong connection to uh, the deaf community because my mother was a teacher of the deaf and worked for a big center, a big public school in New York City, um, and I spent a lot of time there. And what I learned was that a lot of people who are deaf feel that they are not disabled, it's the world that makes them disabled. And I'm interested in talking a little bit more, if you want to, or if you have anything else to say <laughs> about this idea, because I think it's really helpful when people, it's like a new, new glass that someone can put on. They see that they see the whole issue differently when they start to realize, oh, so much of what we consider disability uh, or limitation is actually lack of access or the way our world is built. Um, so I wonder if you want to say a little bit more about that. Absolutely. And that probably plays into the same as the little people community and the people yeah. who may not identify as having a disability. Uh, I would say with both the deaf community and the, dis the little people community and the disability community as a whole, uh, we all tend to have requests for accommodations that can make us more successful in any mm -hmm. environment. Uh, so I think a lot of like the ADA and disability in general there's just a stigma around just accommodations and costs and those things. And I think in that manner, we're all in community because um, it'll help us be more effective if we have that support and the accommodations. But I've definitely heard uh, it's a spoken word of the deaf community and they want people to meet them where they are. And I think it's just yeah, trying to understand each community and lived experience, but not having all the answers. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is like, even when I moved from Boston to California, the amount of people who told my parents, you can't let her do that. How are you going to let her do that? And then uh, my dad was like, why wouldn't I let her do that? That would be a disservice to all of us if we yeah. didn't let her chase what she's passionate about. And she can 
handle herself. Like she was just independent for four years in college. And I think it's just constantly having to remind people like, you don't have to take care of me. It kind of goes back to even just the don't feel bad for me because of my surgeries, just meet me where I am and let me be part of this environment in a seamless way. Don't give me a break. Like if I'm terrible at something, give me the feedback and tell me I'm terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, let's figure out how to work together and learn from each other rather than you assuming that I can't get something done. I was, well, I was in California, one of my jobs, we were going to an award show and people all of a sudden started panicking that I wasn't going to be able to survive at this award show because I was going to get trampled. And we were sitting at a table in a ballroom, yeah. I've been to events in ballrooms before, <laughs> like there was no part of the agenda where it was going to say that I was going to get trampled by people, but it was just this assumption that I can't be part of this environment. And similar thing happened in high school, trying to date and my friends kind of go in a different way because they weren't sure if I was gonna get in the way just because of my existence in college, similar things happened. And it was like, I had to always be mindful of like, these are the realities, but I'm not gonna let it stop me from continuing to live my life. And I think the biggest thing is like figuring out how to have those bumpers to not let every comment, every assumption get to you because society will continue to try to tear you down and you have to just continue to prove that you don't want to be teared down and you won't be teared down. Yeah, it's this terrible balance between asking for access in a way that feels, I usually used to talk to my students about this, that it's actually, you're not asking for anything. You're not begging for anything. You're advocating for what you need and access is yeah. everybody gets what they need. Not one person gets a step up and the other person doesn't. You know, a lot of people still have this idea that accessibility or accommodations is a, a bump up, you know, or a cheating or something. That's still very pernicious in the school system, honestly. Um, the idea that, that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just that balance of like, trying to do it in a strategic way so you're not pushing people away. Yeah. Um, I get, I, I do get heated when it comes to the stool scenario in hotel rooms because I really just want to be able to access the bed to get a good night's sleep, especially being in a town or city I have not, no idea about. Like there's no safeguard other than the room to get a night's sleep and then go do a presentation the next day. So in those scenarios, like I may get just a little emotional about like I need my needs to be met. Yeah. in order for me to get a good night's sleep. But in most scenarios, I don't wanna like fight till we're all blue in the face. I just wanna have a strategic conversation so we can help each other get to that even ground. Cause I just think yelling and screaming and telling everyone everything they did wrong is gonna take us backwards. Yeah, that's, uh, I imagine that's a real skill to have because meeting people where they are can be hard, especially when where they are is offensive to you or hurtful. Um, but I think it's, I, I'm sure your message, that message is really helpful to people because um, we don't have control over what other people do, you know? Um, you mentioned something, you know, this speaks to your dad's approach to letting you go to California. I wanted to ask you, I noticed that in general, we talk a lot, um, especially to women with disabilities and mental illnesses, about the way they are infantilized um, by the general culture or treated like they're not sexual, they can't be adults, they can't um, make their own choices, they have to be protected or angelic. And I noticed that uh, people often use this rhetoric that I found a little worrisome that's like, pe little people are cute or adorable. And that seemed to me to play into this infantilization. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about how that, because I know that's a widespread problem w for people with disabilities in general, but I'm interested in how that is, that's been a part of your experience. Well, that's accurate. Uh <laughs> I would, <laughs> I would say, so my biggest pet peeve is when people talk down to me because I think they assume because of my stature, I must also have cognitive disabilities because they just don't know any different or don't do their research. <laughs> uh, and then there are people who actually make comments too after I open my mouth that I can have an intelligent conversation. They're like, okay, all right, let's just keep going forward. 
yeah. But, uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So when I was living in New York City, I, I always use that example because there are 8 million people in the city and I'm going to come across that many more people a day than I do in other places. And when I was living there, just walking down the street, of course, cat calling would happen all the time. And there are some uncomfortable situations that I just try to ignore because I know I'm not like, I, I have to protect myself too. <laughs> like I can't interact because then they're thinking me engaging with them means that maybe I'm interested. Like it just, it's dangerous. And I think it's, there are those scenarios. I, I, I caught wind of it a little bit when I was working in comedy touring because I would go up, go to up to four shows a night and have to critique comedians. And the minute they see someone who has dwarfism or someone with any difference in the audience, that immediately becomes part of their bit. And it was crazy seeing people in the audience kind of almost be like mama bears trying to protect me just because they saw like how awkward it was and wouldn't laugh when the comedians would make weird comments. But it, so it's something that I've always kind of been knowledgeable of. And um, I happen to be married to another little person, but as I was growing up and going through dating and other scenarios with the safety thing, making sure that they knew that I was a little person and I got a good feel for them that it wasn't just a fetish. And there were some scenarios where it felt like maybe it was like we meet once and uh, you never hear from them again type thing. Yeah. Uh, but I tried to do as much research ahead of time because I'm very knowledgeable that it's a real thing. And then just like on social media, I just block people who make weird comments. It's so much easier to separate that way, especially through social media. Uh, but I think it's just lack of the unknown. And then those people just who have weird fantasies about like, I've never seen this, so might as well be curious. And it's, it, it, definitely I think has probably ruined the self-esteem of some people within the community who fall for it because it depends on maybe how you grow up in your family environment but if mm -hmm. you don't have that love and support and you're craving it elsewhere yeah. some people may find it in the wrong places but it's not yeah. genuine yeah I yeah absolutely it's very fright it, it's sort of a emotional hazard but it's also as you point out a real physical hazard right um, for you know, women in general and non cis people in general, but then especially disabled people, uh, people with disabilities. Um, when we had yeah. a so when we had a conference, last, someone uh, summed it up pretty well. They were like, "I'm thinking about the panel discussion taking place, and I can't help but notice how my demeanor positively changed once a panel is self-disclosed." And I think that also applies to even like the dating world. Like if there was someone who was average height, who had a sibling or relative with some type of disability or difference, you could feel, you can feel that energy is a little bit more genuine and like, I'm curious in a genuine way versus I have a fetish. Yeah. And I think that goes even in the business world of like the minute someone starts sharing their story, you're like, oh, they kind of get it. Like, even though we don't have the same lived experience, they get it a little bit more. Yeah. And then it isn't exploitative. Right. Um, it's empathetic. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a helpful, I think, distinction. Because we talk to young women a lot who have this problem where um, they're open about their conditions on the internet and they're really important role models for other people. But then they get really uh, abusive comments and... Uh, a lot of weird pressure that gets, it's like extra idealization and fantasy gets put on people with disabilities um, in this really unfair way. <laughs> um, yeah, that's helpful. Thank you for that. Um, so I wanted to, I just had two more questions and you've sort of implied a lot of this, but um, what do you wish that people who do not have dwarfism uh, knew about your life and experiences? If you just had to, you know, just say like a couple sentences for them, what do you wish they knew? I like, I'm always amazed. I, I always joke about how my average height sister, I have one sister, she's three and a half years older. And I know that she like loves me unconditionally. And of course we've 
had our different moments throughout our life, but she's a mother of two beautiful children now. And she was always meant to be a mother from the day she was born. And I, I don't even talk about her enough, but should I, I think the way that I see her love on me as a sister makes it so beautiful to think that anyone could be loved regardless of, and same with my parents, but the way that she just admires me and looks up to me as a sister more than just because I have dwarfism, uh, it means that anyone can have any type of relationship. And I, I'm just like, I don't, I, like I haven't really talked about it in this way before, but the fact that like we can have that support and it sometimes has to come from family first because they see you grow up, they see the trials and turbulations, but there's also that uh, divide that can happen sometimes among parents as they're raising t children with disabilities and uh, siblings uh, who siblings of people with disabilities who may be a little resentful because it may require a little bit extra attention. Like I had to go to the doctor in Baltimore at least once a year growing up. I had eight surgeries. There were times where my sister had to be in other places so my parents could help me recover. And she also just didn't want to see me in the hospital or at surgery because it was would have been hurtful for her to see me in that manner. Uh, but I think my parents did such a wonderful job trying to build us both up at the same time. They would take her on outings. They would call them mud baths so I wouldn't want to go, just so they could have that extra time with her as well. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that it's, it's led to a very strong bond that we both have now. And I have been around other people, people who I did live with in New York who have dwarfism, and they don't have those types of relationships. And it really starts with the family and how you're raised. And I think it's just amazing to see that like even when it came to babysitting growing up she was like always a babysitter that's one of the other things like always meant to be a great mother mm -hmm. but she would try to pitch me to other to places and we would have to add a little bit more context and build a different level of trust and it wasn't that I couldn't do it it was just the family's not quite sure because they didn't know me they didn't know what I was capable of but she would always pitch me and even to different types of jobs, like just as her sister, <laughs> like she didn't need to add more context. And so when I see that, like among family members, even my dad's sisters, like we may, they're all six, five and we're in public and they get so confused when people point and stare because they just don't see me as anything different. So when you get to that point where you realize you can be seen as a human being, above all else like that's what really matters and hopefully we can get everyone to be seen that way yeah it's such an important point about how when you really connect with somebody it can really transcend you know profound differences and it's an important reminder right now given everything we're going through as a nation yeah. and how divided we feel and stressed where you know everybody's under a great deal of stress right now um, that's amazing. I, I find it infuriating that people, that it's an experience that people, uh, little people have that people point at you. I find that I'm just having a reaction to that. Um, I was with my family cool. once we were out go, getting ready to go to a table at a, a dinner. I think it was Mother's Day or Father's Day. And there was a mother that like obviously pointed to her child and said, look over there. And you're like, what are you teaching? It's, it is enraging me <laughs> hearing that. I mean, I know intellectually that it happens. Right. And I'm naive because of my privilege as an average headed person, but it's, it's so upsetting to hear that. Um, and so bizarre that people have that react, that, at least to me, that's just upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that probably you're really able to impart, you know, I can see why you've had so much success as a motivational speaker because uh, there's a very, very hard won strength that is emanating off you. Um, and I think we all, you know, all have our battles and really respond to that. So I think probably everybody you speak to has a, something to learn there. Um, and I think it's just leaving room for forgiveness and uh, not holding grudges and moving forward so we can all get better together. I think there's just so much fear of 
doing or saying the wrong thing. And th by not doing, you're preventing from doing the right thing. But I think it's people like you who've risen in their career and are paying it forward who are able to say to average headed people, you know, oh, that wasn't okay and let me show you how to do it better next time. Uh, because I think when people, you know, are young or they're not finding that success or acceptance, they're too vulnerable, you know, to, with, with whatever situation they're in, you know. Um, and so I think it's really important that people in your, in, like you in a leadership position are sort of using their power that way because, you know, it can feel really scary to disclose uh, an illness or a disability on a job, you know, at an entry level. I mean, it does, it feels that way at any level, but, um, but I think, you know, your bravery when you're at that level in your career where people look up to you that, and I'm sure like the example you, you brought up with the person at Microsoft, you know, someone being in this elevated position and making it a priority really, it's a really good way to use your power. <laughs> I think. And I think even if it's just finding one person you can trust who may have a similar lived experience or opens up, I, I feel fortunate that I can't hide my difference. So people do tend to open up to me, which is a blessing, but I hope that they're confident enough to tell other people too. But even if there's just one person that you can just release a little bit of what you're going through and just talk it out, I think it'll allow for more people to just feel a little bit more at ease. Yeah. Um, so my last question was sort of what would you say to your younger self if you knew what you know now? Um, which is kind of cheesy, but I also think uh, we have a lot of young people in our community. I think they could benefit from, from some advice in that direction. Well, I think the big piece is since I'm constantly retelling the 100 interview story, if I were to go back, I wish I could just like get rid of the elephant in the room and say, I know you feel uncomfortable right now. How can I help you feel more comfortable so then we can be more effective as we go through the rest of the interview? And I know that may have been thought about as not being on me and my responsibility, but I could have maybe taken a little bit more ownership of that or reached out to intentionally get a little bit more feedback, even though I did ask for it as I was writing my thank you notes. Uh, please let me know if there's anything I could learn to do better or any of that, but I, I probably could have been a little bit more intentional about that. I think it's just the fear of even during those five years at the talent agency, not really asking someone to help me and it got to the point where I had been there long enough where people started asking what I was passionate about and they started to support me in that way but it wasn't me standing up for myself like how do I move forward how can I get the support I need so I think just speaking up more about what I'm passionate about but I still am not regretting the fact that I worked really hard without sharing my passion early on because you need to gain credibility in your in a profession first before people start to respect you and support whatever your goals and dreams may be next um, so long as it's kind of on the path to helping you get there yeah. and then I would just say if people tell you you can't do something don't just take one person's no or assumption because uh, that's one person's assumption or no I was speaking at a school one time, it was a group of sixth graders, and this girl said to me, my dad told me that I can't be a teacher even though I want to be one because the market's saturated or something crazy. And I thought, first off, you're in sixth grade, and why is your dad telling you that you can't be in a profession that's always going to need more good people to be in the profession? And the market might be totally different in 20 yeah. years. Like the, all, this, all the context will be different. <laughs> And it just, I don't like when people try to stomp on people's dreams without seeing them make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's incredible. Um, incredibly helpful, I think. Um, you know, as you point out, you shouldn't have to be the one to make it comfortable in the interview room as the entry level person speaking to the CEO. But that might just be the situation you're in and it might make your life easier if you were able to. Um, and so I think that's really helpful advice. Um, 
There was one yeah. time so oh, I, I try just kind of one more thing about no, just, please. Yeah. Uh, being in environments where there are other little people. I try to intentionally find general practitioners who have treated at least one other little person. Uh, sometimes there's not the possibility of another being in the community, uh, but I specifically went to a dermatologist in Los Angeles once that I had friends who had gone to. So I thought, okay, credibility, they'll be, they'll give me good bedside manner. They'll be respectful. I ended up falling and I cut my head and I had to get stitches and I went back to that dermatologist's office to get the stitches removed. And the dermatologist that I usually go to sent someone else into the office to help me take my stitches out. But it was someone who was like shaking because they'd never met me before and they didn't know how to react. And I had to like, that was one of those moments where I was like, you need to go find the guy that I come here for because it's clear you're uncomfortable and those tweezers are gonna like stab me. Yeah. And I had to just like, so there are those moments where if I have to speak up because it's gonna put me in danger, if I don't, uh, I will. But hopefully we can get to a point where we're all understanding before it, it elevates to that level. But I use that example because yeah. It's tough to think that even people who are highly educated uh, go into these professions, maybe have a chapter on dwarfism at one point in their education, but maybe not. Uh, we have to then train to not be scared of us. And then we have to go to them for trusted advice uh, uh, related to our health. Yeah, or to know your body. I mean, they, they're maybe not educated about your body, you know, which is frightening. Do you know the actress Ali Stroker? Yes, I love her. Oh, she's great. Yeah, we interviewed her and she calls it hosting your own party. She wrote something for us a long time ago that was really great. And she sums up what you're talking about as she's like, you have to be the host of your own party. So she talks about how she, in the, when she first moved to New York, she was letting uh, cab drivers put her chair into the um, trunk of the car and then she had to learn to say no don't touch me wait a second here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna take the wheels because it was getting damaged right. um, and she she uses an example to describe you know I'm the one who has to be a little more confident a little bit more in charge of the situation and that's incredibly hard you know yeah. uh, I'm not minimizing that at all but it's very it's a very uh, smart st strategy I think uh, for dealing with the world in general uh, for all of us probably <laughs> there was like one time so I was living in Washington Heights in New York for the four years I was there and there was one time where I definitely did not feel safe and I felt like someone was following me almost to my apartment building and yeah. I just like kind of ran from the bus to the apartment building and then was able to close the door like the front locked door and immediately I saw one of my roommates walking out and it was just like a sense of ease that like someone I know and trust is right there but it's so scary when those scenarios happen. And even with uh, wheelchair users and like, you're trusting them to put your chair in the, and hopefully they get it out. And in, a, in one piece, yeah, absolutely. Or on an airline or something yeah. like that, where you have to ask somebody to store, you know, your mobility device, or your walker or something like that. Um, that's a lot of trust you're putting in somebody who d maybe doesn't have the awareness and might just do something unconscious that could hurt you, you know, not, not even meaning to. Um, well, that's really helpful. Is there anything else you want to talk about or tell our community? I just want everyone to stay empowered and not give up, even though we're in crazy times. I think there's an advantage for us to connect more and on deeper levels. Uh, we always talk about how um, there's no one story is more important than another. I tell people whenever they try to tell me, oh, I had this thing happen to me, but it's not as bad as what happened to you. Like challenges are challenges and we're all equipped to deal with them differently, but I'm not gonna think less of you because you're complaining about something that was really hard for you. And then I think the piece is the more voices we have out there, the more people in the next generation can see what's possible for them. And I want people to get to a point where you don't have to see it in the media, you don't have to see it in society. You can just chase what you wanna do in your life. Uh, but I just don't think we're there yet. People wanna see people like them in roles, in positions, in entertainment, 
uh, in order for them to know the possibilities of the world. Absolutely. Um, and I do think that even though disability representation is getting better in the media and in Hollywood, I do think that little people are not as represented as other communities. You know, we're seeing a lot of actors and models with Down syndrome. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people with who don't fit into the traditional model box um, who are breaking into fashion. And I'm not seeing that as much in terms of the little person community. And I think because of cable TV, there's a lot of possibility for a lot of reality that doesn't necessarily always put us in a positive light. Uh, so if you see someone on TV, don't think the next person you see in person is that person. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think people get really excited about meeting famous people, but you want to meet the person first and treat them like a person. And I, I often do do the comparison of uh, just how people treat people with disabilities versus how they treat celebrities. Like everyone has a certain level of privacy that they may want or need, and you need to figure out how to have an intentional conversation without pushing people away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you make such a good point about reality shows. We should all remember that all reality shows are extreme versions <laughs> of life, no matter what they depict, whether it's a family or, you know, the real housewives. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it would be terrible if that was the, I mean, it's a, it's a bad situation if that's the only representation we're getting. That's, that's worrying because no one would ever think, you know, suburban moms are exactly like the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills or something That's like that. Thing. So uh, with those types of shows, people can leave that at the door. They'll watch it and just say trashy TV. But yeah. every single portrayal of a little person is a portrayal of a little person and how people may treat that next person they see. And it, it may only be once in someone's lifetime that they see a little person in person. So it like they may not carry that knowledge and those people who do say i'm that crazy person on tv they're a little harder to educate than the person next to them do you think that that lack of media representation has to do with the historic uh fact that little people were involved in entertainment but in ways that were often really decorating cons elves yeah i uh, just it's not part of the storytelling because a lot of writers are writing based on their lived experiences yeah. and if you haven't met a little person in real life i think a lot of peter dinklage's roles came from the relationships that he built along the way like i think station agent had something to do with someone involved in game of thrones like it all kind of yeah weaved in he got to the point where people were knocking on his door but he he is viewed as a talented actor who happens to have dwarfism. And I think at the end of the day, regardless of identity first, person first language, people want to be known for their skill set. Of course. And they yeah. can contribute to society. And I think that he is a true example of that. And we want to see more of that. Agreed. I guess I was just thinking that, you know, in sort of other, there's some disabilities that never got any representation. And so that's new and we're seeing that in a positive way. But I think maybe I'm, I'm wondering maybe if the little person community has to sort of combat mm -hmm. negative representation. So it's not just that it was hidden, you know, like some disabilities, which were totally kept off uh, of media, but it was really exploited, you know? And so I agree. Peter Dinklage is such a um, important example of that because he's so respected for his craft of acting. And that's the first thing that people know about him. And I think the exploitation sometimes comes from uh, that, those earlier portrayals. And then in people's families, if the families still view the way they raise their child as part of that earlier portrayal, that then makes that child feel empowered to agree to uh, negative things. Like another thing that's real big in the community uh, when it comes to advocating and protecting our community is dwarf tossing. There are still bars around the country and world where you can go and pay $10 and watch dwarfs get tossed across the room. And then you ask the bar, bar owner, like, how the heck could you, would, would you do that? And they're like, we're paying them a good salary and they agreed to do it. It's a job for them. And a lot of that even came from the movie Wolf of Wall Street, there's a dwarf tossing scene in the beginning. And then I hear, I, 
I talk about it and reference it, but I still refuse to watch it because of what is going on. Uh, there's a later scene that talks about how our community is okay with it because it's a source of living income. And that is not what we want to see. Yeah. And, I, and Peter Dinklage, even in one of his award speeches, told people to look up this guy, Martin Henderson, who's now since passed, but he was one of the people who had been tossed in a bar, not for that an event, but he just was at a bar and got tossed because people thought it was okay. And then I was just going to say, I have a friend who was knocked off a bar stool um, in a bar, and I see a strong connection between dwarf tossing and what happened to him where he was attacked. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like people assume that we think it's okay because it's a source of income, but it it's inhumane. Of course. Yes, absolutely. And just because a previous generation only gave people certain options, uh, and people made a living that way doesn't mean we have to keep doing that. You know, that's true in lots of ways in our society. Women, people of color, you know, only had certain options. That doesn't mean we can accept that for the future. You know, that's, it's absolutely horrifying. Um, and I, I thought that had mostly been banned and I'm disturbed to know that that's not true. Um, this. And, and even something, you're bringing up such a good point about The Wolf of Wall Street, which is a movie, I actually, only saw the end of that movie, so I don't know the scene you're referring to. Um, I must have just caught it at a friend's house or something. But I remember, it's supposed to be sort of satirical, but it's still glorifying these things. And so there's a real problem there with representation because the movie and the makers of the movie get to say, well, we're actually making fun of these people. We think this guy's a jerk. Mm -hmm. But people watch it, young people watch it, and people of all ages watch it. and see the money and the success and you know sex drugs and rock and roll lifestyle that he leads and admire it and then you can track that to a spike in assaults i mean that's really scary or or to this this idea being you know becoming more popular that's that's frightening it's so true and it's just and it really has to do with giving the new parents the tools to feel equipped to empower their children to do beyond what we've been seen as doing historically. And I think it just, it really takes the whole family coming together and supporting each other as they navigate how to do life a little bit differently. Because you're involved in, in enter, you know, you have a historical interest in entertainment. Do you have any recommendations for actors or actresses who are little people that our community should be following, learning about, you know, tracking their career? Is there anybody that you're watching that you're really excited about? It's a great question. Uh, so this guy, Nick Novicki, is a little person, and he started this program called the Disability Film Challenge through Easter Seals. And he has built a great platform for people to show their skills through uh, short films oh, that's awesome. uh, and then i think even tomorrow night or some night this week i know there's an ada celebration that Allie's a part of danny woodburn's a part of uh, so danny's been a well-known actor from seinfeld and other things and uh, mark povanelli he's actually president of little people of america he was in water for elephants been in several different films i think I wish that I had more to <laughs> list and I think it's just getting having access to the platform. Yeah. I have a friend Casey who does a lot of stunt work. Uh, she's working on a lot of uh, different motion capture type films. Mm -hmm. A lot of little people stand in for children on television shows because we're the height of children and uh, they can make a pretty decent income and be part of that set community. Uh, we can continue the dialogue and make sure people have access to the tools, but Gail Williamson is a huge advocate in the space who works at KMR Talent, and she oversees uh, the support of talent with all types of disabilities. So she is amazing at making sure that people are seen. Uh, she talked about how the first three years of representing actors with disabilities, she made 
maybe she helped them make about like 50,000 and now it's over 3 million that these people are making. So there's definitely more exposure happening, happening. Casting Society of America is working on a lot of great initiatives to understand the needs of the community so they can integrate them more into auditions. And it takes making auditions accessible. <laughs> Yeah. I've heard horror stories of wheelchair users having to audition in alleyways because they can't access the casting office. And then there's these trucks coming by and they're not able to give it their all in their audition. So it's really, it's getting better and there's still a lot of work to be done. But I would say just intentionally, whether it's in blog storytelling or writing film or TV or videos, just try to intentionally find more people like me to share their stories. So then we can, I guess, normalize things if normal's even a thing. That's great. And that's actually, you know, you've given me so much time. I really appreciate it because this has just been such a useful and moving conversation for me. And I think our community will really like it. Um, I'm wondering where people can follow you. If you could tell our community members, you know, if there's social media you do, where they can find information about you, if they want to uh, have you speak to their community or something like that. Absolutely. Uh, my website is beckymotivates.com. And you can find me on most of the platforms with that same handle, Instagram, Twitter, under LinkedIn, I'm Becky Karin Kakula, YouTube, Becky Motivates. I definitely encourage checking out the YouTube because I try to make it as current as possible and oh, add videos even during these times. <laughs> and of course, anyone can reach out to me and I can answer any questions, beckymotivates at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.